Well, you can turn back over to Ephesians chapter 5 this morning. What I'm teaching this morning is a lot of the same material I used to teach at family life conferences and revival meetings uh, around the country. And, uh, of course, the substance of these messages are very much practical theology. And uh, they're not hellfire and brimstone messages, but they are very convicting. They're certainly convicting to me when I uh, studied them and convicting to me as I preach them. So the application is uh, not just for you, it's also for me. But uh, they also can be messages that can be very uncomfortable. And remember that the Bible is not intended to, to make us comfortable the Bible is intended to challenge us, especially in areas where we are lacking. And in what we're talking about here in chapter 5 of uh, Ephesians and in chapter 6 are certainly areas where we all fail. And it's certainly something we should confront in our own lives and make a decision as God uh, speaks to us about these issues to um, make some decisions necessary to correct these things and be more consistent in the way we live our lives. Now one of the greatest failures of Christian, the Christian life, including my own, is consistency. Would you agree? Being consistent and not just get into the rote, the routine of doing what we need to do, but our heart has to be in it. And so as we come to this, this morning, you can see that we're looking at biblical leadership and making submission easy. Now, I, I believe that this is where most men fail, is in biblical leadership. We think that we're being good leaders because we boss everybody around, and that's not good leadership. Good leadership uh, leads by being a servant and uh, more like a shepherd who moves the sheep, not drives the sheep. He shepherds the sheep. And uh, that is, he is guiding and directing them as they move. Now, yes, sometimes a shepherd leads from the front, but most of the time he leads from the back. And that is the way a father does in his home. He is guiding and directing his sheep and protecting them. So as we come here to chapter 5, uh, we're looking at leadership. Now we're looking at two levels of leadership. There's a leadership of the wife as she submits to her husband. What's she teaching her children in the world? What is she teaching? What is the leadership role that she has? She is leading in biblical submission and teaching lordship. One of the reasons why we have so few children who grow up with the understanding of biblical lordship is because they don't have a mother who teaches and leads in biblical role model of lordship. And she does that by her uh, leadership role in submitting to her husband. Now the other role is the leadership role of the, of the husband and he is to lead by teaching his children how to love. And by doing that, he is also learning himself how to love and how to give himself away. Now, those are things we need to teach our children. And if children do not grow up learning how to love, if they're constantly fighting and bickering between one another, especially in your own home, and children do that, siblings, they really haven't learned how to love one another and accept one another. And that's usually because the father hasn't had a good leadership role in that model of what that means uh, in his home. So come here to verse 21 of uh, Ephesians chapter 5, my word of prayer. Lord, as we bow again this morning, we ask that uh, you would help us to understand this text. It's very convicting to us, Father, for we fail in it very often. And help us learn to what it means to be a leader, both the wives and the husband in their home, so we can raise up children to your honor and glory. And that, Lord, that we could be a blessing both to you and to our children. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
So it starts off in verse 21 with the universal principle of submission. Submitting yourselves one to another, that's Christians, one to another in the fear of God. And then it picks up and starts dealing with individuals. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Not in everybody's husbands. You're not responsible to submit to everybody's husbands. Now there are some universal principles in the church. Uh, the women shall keep silence in the church. Otherwise that word there is, is the Greek word husikeo. And it means have, have a meek and quiet spirit. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, when it's talking about tongues, there it uses the Greek word sageos. And that means you are to be silent. Don't speak in tongues. Women are not to speak in tongues. Now, so it says here, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband. Now, yourselves means this is your active voice. It's your responsibility. And then what's that next little word that's underlined up there on your screen? As unto the Lord. That's like as. Now remember, husbands, you're not the Lord. Your wife is to submit, you, submit to you as unto the Lord. So at least try to live like Jesus would live. At least try to be like Jesus. Then it becomes a lot easier. And then it says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Now, this is this issue of, of uh, relational uh, subordination. Christ is the head of the church, and so the husband, the, the, the Christ is the head of the husband, then the husband is the head of the wife. It's a relational subordination. And he, Christ, is the savior of the body, the church. Now, that doesn't mean the wife, the husband saves his wife. The, the analogy here is um, the husband gives himself for his wife to, uh, you know, to uh, make sure that she is provided for. Verse 24, therefore, as, just, just like the church is subject unto Christ, we wouldn't argue that, right? The church, the body, is subject to the head. So let the wives be to their own husbands. This is a pattern in everything. Now, that's a, those are pretty concise statements. We'll look at them a little further more, but I want to come down here to verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Even, what's the next word? As Christ also loved the church. Now, that's a pretty high example. And gave himself for it. What is that? He died for it. He died to birth the church. And that, of course, he does through birthing individual Christians, through being born again. But he died so that could happen. That's a pretty high example. That he, verse 26, Christ might sanctify and cleanse, purify it, uh, the church, with the washing of water. This is not baptism. Uh, it's a bath to purge worldliness out of the church. How do you do that? You replace worldliness with the teaching of the word of God. So as you teach and understand the word of God, you are replacing the thoughts of worldliness. What, what happens in that exchange? One is repentance, things you don't believe in anymore, that's okay. And it's then turning to the things that you do believe. And by that is what Romans 12, 2 talks about, is the transfiguration, a progressive transfiguration in our life, by, by that transition. And then he goes on and he says, uh, that, or so that he might present it to himself, Jesus, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now, when I was growing up, my mother ironed everything. She ironed our t-shirts, she ironed our, our, our underwear, she ironed our blue jeans, 
everything was iron. We went to, if we, you know, when we could start wearing blue jeans to, to school, before that we couldn't do that, but uh, I was one of the few kids in school that had creases in my blue jeans <laughs> when I wore them. But uh, everything, mom iron. What, what is that? So it's, it's, it's for appearance, sure. But Christ's concept here is that uh, it is real. It's real. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church. He's not concerned about anybody else. He's concerned about how that church is in its relationship to him. This is how the husband should consider his family. It's not about uh, necessarily him. It's about how, his, how that father leads so that his family can have a relationship with Christ. But before he can lead his family in that relationship with Christ, he has to have that relationship. And we shouldn't assume that simply because he thinks he has that relationship, he's leading his family in that relationship. When the fact is not, that's not the case. Uh, he, he, you know, he can have his own devotions and he can pray and be a, a man that is right with God. But the point is he's supposed to be leading his family in that same pattern. Teaching them how to do that. So there's personal devotions and there's family devotions. And and those those should be part of who we are. I know when our children were were young, they always loved to have their time to read the scripture during family devotions. And uh, our daughter Darcy, when she was going to kindergarten, she wanted to learn to read so badly. Why? So she could have her turn in reading a chapter of scripture uh, when it came to be the, the kids' turn to read. They, they would go through it and they she could read. And so she learned. She really learned to read. And uh, when we had the ki kindergarten graduation at our church, she was uh, such a blessing because she stood up and read uh, a, a chapter of scripture uh, for uh, her time of uh, shining, if you will. <laughs> so... Uh, and you know, we should teach our children that. So, and then he goes on and he says, verse 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own body. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Now, if you really, you know, there, there was a book uh, written a number of years ago by a man. I can't remember his name. He says, uh, was a book against self-love, which was a big thing back in the 80s. But uh, we love ourselves by loving someone else. Why? Because when you love your wife the way she should be loved and, and deserves to be loved, uh, as, God, as Christ loves the church, when you love her that way, who, who really benefits? Well, you do. You're the one that receives the, the, the gratitude for that and, uh, the, you know, the blessing of that relationship. That, but the relationship is reciprocal. And, you know, what you give, you get. And that's an important principle. So he says, uh, for no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourish it and cherish it. Uh, two qualifiers here for loving your wife. You nourish that means you feed. The word actually means to breastfeed. You nurture. And that's it. That shows an intimacy and cherish it. See, that's how you love your wife. You nourish, you, you feed, you and you cherish. It's precious. It's like a jewel that's precious to you. And then it goes what? Even, what's the next word? As the Lord, the church. Now, that's a pretty high example. For, because, we are members of his body, of his flesh, on his bones. Now, that's the concept here of the body of Christ. This new Genesis. We, this new Genesis, new creation in Jesus Christ. We now become... Uh, 
very much part of, by recreation, part of the person of Jesus Christ, genealogically connected through the blood of Christ. We're born again. And then for uh, another four, because for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and these two shall be one flesh. Now, this is much more than a physical union. I was using that metaphor here of a physical union, but it is a union now that God has created between God, a wife, and her husband. It's a tri-unity, if you will, that God has created. And they are, are now one flesh in the eyes of God. So marriage is not just a contract. It's a union between God that is covenantal. And one of the responsibilities of the husband is to love his wife, of the wife to submit to her head, her husband. Now, he goes on in verse 32. This is a great mystery. Otherwise, this is hard to understand. But, he now he explains it. I speak concerning Christ and the church. The relationship between Christ and local churches is the same relationship of the husband and the wife have and the wife and the husband have. It's the same relationship. And if you're part of the body of Christ, you should have that relationship with your head. You are the bride of Christ, and therefore you are the espoused bride of Christ. One day there'll be the marriage supper of the Lamb, and you should submit to Jesus Christ as the head of the church, and you should be willing and wanting to submit. should be from your heart. Now, if you're a, the kind of husband that God wants you to be, it'll be easy for your wife to do that. If you're not the kind of husband that God wants you to be, it's going to be hard for your wife to do that. And it's going to be very difficult for your wife to do that. Don't make it difficult. Make it easy. And it goes on, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular, individually, so love his wife even as himself. And then the wife, see that she reverence. Uh, her husband. So we have this summary statement of these two leadership role models uh, in the uh, home and in the church. Now, if you fail at these role models, you're going to fail your children. And it's very critical that we learn how to deal with this because if we fail our children, we're not going to have another generation that's going to come along and follow up. Uh, knowing this, and, and I know that a very a large percentage of uh, husbands and wife relationships do not know how to resolve conflict and get things straightened out when it happens. And usually what happens is unresolved contract, conflict builds up and builds up. It's not resolved, and then they add up and they add up and they add up until finally someone says, I'm, I'm all done with this. Now, here, here's a principle for you. Leadership is a trust gift from God. Otherwise, he trusts you with that gift. He gifted it to you. It is an overwhelmingly large responsibility. Uh, I have been, uh, over the years, and I think on two occasions, been asked to be the uh, trust guard, guardian of a trust for someone's will after they died. And in one, in, one case, I was... Uh, there were some people didn't like the way the will was set up and they thought this person who was excluded from the will by this man uh, should have been included and they, uh, they uh, resisted it. I said, well, I'm not going to do it anyway but what he said because I was a trust. I was a guardian of that trust. I said, I'm going to do it the way he wants it done. And if you want to do that, uh, I said, if you want to give him some of the money that you are getting, that's fine with me, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do it exactly the way he put it in his will. Why? Because it was, I was trusted. It was a gift to me because 
He trusted me to do it the way he wanted it to do. Now that's what leadership is. It's a trust gift from God. And boy, you're going to answer for it. One of the things that we're going to stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ is how well we use this trust gift that God gave us. Now, don't let that slip off your off of my tongue and, and miss your brain someplace, and certainly don't let it miss your heart, because I believe that's going to be one of the biggest areas of the judgment seat of Christ right here. Responsibility and accountability are intrinsic to any leadership role. Did you get that? Responsibility and accountability are intrinsic to any leadership role. Now this means someone entrusted with leadership must understand that he, she has, a, has certain specific responsibilities as a leader and will be held accountable for God how those, for how those responsibilities are accomplished. And this is defining faithfulness. So a good leader looks over his shoulder on a regular basis to assure himself that those he is leading are still with him. Because <laughs> simply because you're leading, that doesn't mean anybody's following. And unfortunately, that is often the case in many churches and why they die. is Because you know, people, uh, the, the leadership that's provided and the teaching that's provided, they're not put into practical, any practical application of the life. So the husband leads what? In teaching love. The wife leads in teaching lordship. If your children grow up to be unloving, mostly because the husbands fail. Now they still have their own will. And they can be unloving, and rebellious. But it is a husband's job to teach that and to lead them through that. The wife, it's her job through submission to her husband uh, to teach lordship. And, it, of course, that's a big issue. Now, usually when Ephesians 5, 21 through 33 is taught, the focus is upon submission by the wife to her husband. I've listened to so many sermons preached on this, and that's where the preacher camps on it and, um, and you know, spends all the time on it and uh, never addresses, really, I think, which is the primary level of submission, and that is the husband submitting uh, by loving his wife. Well, I just got an advertisement for swans, uh, so uh, but we'll skip that for right now. So, however, the text, the emphasis of the text is the husband's responsibility of spiritual leadership. That's a main subject, main thrust, uh, main volume of the text. And uh, when the husband's leadership is what it ought to be, he'll make his wife's and children's submission to his leadership much easier. Now, we're all rebels by nature, but it'd be much easier. And, and that's why the wife can say, boy, it's easy to be submissive to my husband. Now, one reason that many wives and children have such difficulty with submission to their husband is that their husband is such a poor leader. I've had men say, well, I'm not a very good leader. Well, be one. <laughs> Stop being a poor leader. You can't, you're not going to be able to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and say, well, I'm not a very good leader. You're going to say, yeah, you're supposed to be one. You should get lot, work at it, get better at it. Plan. Now, Ephesians 5.22, I think, could be paraphrased like this. Wives, follow your husband's leadership as, as if he were the Lord Jesus himself. Now remember, he's, that, that's only leadership in righteousness. When he wants you to do something unrighteous, you don't have to follow it. And you should tell him that. I've said this over the years. Husbands should be ministering to their wives, and wives should be ministering to their husbands. And when either one of them get out of alignment, who should be the one who will they, they will hear more than anyone else? The husband gets out of line. Who should be he more open to hearing than anyone else who might uh, give him rebuke or rebuke or reproof? Well, his wife. Why? 
Because she loves you. How about the wife? When she's out of line, who should she listen to more than anyone else? Well, she should want to listen to her husband who's now ministering to her. See, it's, it's a recipro reciprocity issue. They both minister one to another. A husband should work on becoming the kind of leader that makes it easy for his wife to confidently follow his leadership. But leadership is a trust of which others need you to excel. Don't make excuses that you're a poor leader. Be a good one. Be a better one. And constantly seek to improve. Any questions or comments so far? Brian? Brian? What, uh, when, like, asking kids to do something for you, um, you need help with something, maybe you're tired or something like that, uh, do you think it's selfishness to ask your kids to help you with something when you could do it, it's just that you're tired? No, I don't think, I think uh, you can ask, ask and should ask your children to do things with you. Um, not no, they should have their own chores that they should do and be responsible to get those done. And many of those things should be assigned. And when they do them well, leadership rewards them. We'll deal with uh, some of these issues of good leadership here in a minute. But uh, when you have assigned chores for people to do, um, I always say do it with them first. And doing it with them, you're teaching them how to do it. And then um, let them do it. That's the next issue. And then you're inspecting as they do it. And then pretty soon you can trust them to do it all by themselves. But never forget to reward. And wh when you're tired, if your children have been taught the way they should have been taught, they should never have to be asked. They should just volunteer. I mean, when they, when they see things that need to be done that they can do, they shouldn't have to be asked by anyone to do it. That's good leadership. And teaching them and rewarding them for it when they do that, I think is very much part of good leadership. Does that answer your question? I was looking at it kind of from a different, uh, I understand that, but, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's put it really simply. Let's say I'm tired and I'm sitting on the couch. And I want to get something out of the refrigerator, but I don't want to get out to get it. If I ask one of my kids to get it for me, is that selfish? No, I don't think so. If you ask it nice and thank them for it, give them a hug and a kiss when they get it. It's, it I don't think it's a selfish thing. It, uh, you know, I have the same thing. My wife is constantly, she gets upset with me if I get up and I've been working hard and I come in, I plot down in my chair and I'm exhausted, uh, she'll get upset with me if I get up and get something for myself. She says, all you need to do, let me know. And uh, she'd get upset. But, uh, you know, that's just because somebody loves you and they're aware of who you are and aware of what you've done and what your shortcomings are. Now, she works equally as hard uh, now. And, of course, as we get older, it doesn't take quite as much to make us tired. But... Uh, so let me give you five essentials here to good leadership, good spiritual leadership. The first one is the foundation of good leadership is sound spiritual decision making. Sound spiritual decision making. That's primary. Good decisions are based upon the application of foundational truths. And the application of these truths to various situations of life is what the Bible calls wisdom. Otherwise, it's not enough to know it. It's know when to use it. That's the application of that truth. And so, th therefore, doctrinal foundations are essential to good decision making. And remember that for your children because you're teaching them leadership. You're teaching them every time a decision has to be made by your children, don't make the decision for them. Give them the Bible truth to make the decision upon. 
Here's a Bible truth. Now, what do you think? How do you apply this to your life? Because you've just been given them an, by them an opportunity to teach leadership uh, to themselves and how to do the same with other people. Now, Proverbs 3, you're all familiar with these first eight verses of this Proverbs, but it says, My son, forget not my law. Now, this is twofold. This is God teaching his children and Solomon teaching his children. But I think the highest principle is this is God teaching his children. We can use this text. The Proverbs are all very good text to teach your children. And uh, if you're going to have family devotions with your family, I think Proverbs, is, you can spend pretty much a lifetime in Proverbs, and then when you get done, come back and start over again, and uh, you're not going to exhaust it. So he says, my son, forget not my law, but let thine heart, long pause, keep my commandments. Now, what is God teaching us here? First verse, what is God teaching us here? What are you going to teach your children? Don't know? Don't care? Huh? Okay. The point is, what, what Maria? Okay, not forgetting them. I think the main thrust of the text is your heart's got to be in it. Your heart's got to be in it. And let thine heart keep my commandments. We can teach the commandments all day long, but if you don't love the Lord with all your heart, with all your might, uh, with all your soul, uh, the whole issue is that your heart's not going to be in it. Isn't that, isn't that what Israel, how they failed? The whole nation failed. Because they kept the letter of the law, but not the spirit, which is your heart's not in it. And then he goes on and he says, now verse 1 is, is all, all you really need. If you get that one, the rest of it makes sense. But the point is, if your heart's not in it, the rest of it doesn't make sense. For the length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. What's he talking about? Commandments. When your heart's in it, long life, peace, shall they add to thee. When your heart's in it, then you'll not, let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Why? Because you love them. Not just because you're doing it, because you're supposed to do it. You love them. Write them upon what? The table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and men. Otherwise, they're going to know your heart's in it. They're going to know you're real. Now, verse 5. Trust in the Lord, what? With all thine heart. Now, that means your heart's in it. And lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. Why? Because your heart's in it. And he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thy own eyes. Fear the Lord. If your heart's in it, you're going to fear the Lord. That's a reverential awe of God. And depart from evil. That should be health to thine able and marrow to thy bones. Come down to chapter 4 and look at verses 1 through 7. Not moving? Huh? I got it back. Good. So you're working? Good. <laughs> Proverbs 4, look at verse 1. Hear ye children, the instruction of, doesn't say your father, what? Well, says a father. Now this is an instruction to children. And attend to know, what? Understanding. For I give you good doctrine. This is a father to his children. Forsake ye not my law. For I was my father's son. I'm passing it now down unto you. 
tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. I was my, she, she, she nurtured me. He, my father, taught me also and said unto me, let thine heart retain my words. This is another generation. Keep my commandments and live. Get wisdom. Same principle we have up to the fathers. Get understanding. Forget it not, neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not. That's wisdom. And she shall preserve thee. Love her, wisdom, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is a principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. What is wisdom again? The application of the truths we know. When, when it is need to be applied and the timing of those things. So wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. Now, understanding is how wisdom is applied. Right. Do you think when it says here uh, that uh, my father taught me also that he's not referring to God the Father, but he's literally referring to David? It's two. It, it's both. It's God the Father, who is the ultimate example, and our own father. David was, of course, Solomon's, and David did the same thing. But uh, um, the rest of David's children didn't do it, turn out too well. So Solomon didn't really do it either too well, did he? So we can see that David tried. Yeah, yeah, he did. And, and uh, the, the principles are here. Um, you know, David messed up and, of course, set a pretty bad example. Uh, for his children and many things, but he tried to recover and, and, and make better decisions. But I see it as, as twofold. And, and the better principle, of course, is that we have God the Father who teaches one generation who is now to teach another generation. And th that's the highest level. So we, it's dualistic, and I think, in its concept. Same as chapter, uh, same as chapter 3. So the first decision men need to make is to establish spiritual priorities for their families. And what you make, what priorities you make are going to be your children's priorities. And the priority of all Christian leadership is to be followers of Jesus Christ. If that is not your priority, don't expect your children to have it. The husband must be sure he communicates that reality that God is first to his family and everything he does and says. Now, uh, today as we go into this world, um, you know, we have all kinds of things that compete for church. But if church is not your first priority, don't expect it to be your children's. We have hockey that goes on all winter long and we have families that have their kids and children hockey and then on Sundays they have tournaments and they are gone all day. Keeps it in the summer. They have soccer and and uh, baseball games and every, softball, everything else under the sun that competes against the church. Well, that should not be a competition. Should not be a competition that you have time to go out and do something else, but not lead your family in devotions. Should should not be a competition. For you to have your own devotions and own prayer time and then prayer time with your family. It shouldn't be a competition. So the fathers, uh, he is to communicate to his family that he is a commander in chief in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and is accountable to his following, to following his commands. Jesus is the commander in chief. And I have some commandments from him that are going to be prioritized. So the father's leadership role is divinely appointed and ultimately directed, uh, directly accountable to God. God first. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11.3, as he comes into this chapter of, on the Lord's Supper. But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ. Every man. And the head of the woman is a man, and the head of Christ is God. That is relational functionality or relational subordination. Even Christ um, is subject unto the Father uh, in this. And of course, um, whether or not that is eternal uh, subjugation or subordination or simply Christological uh, subordination, 
Uh, I'm not going to get into that debate. I know it is certainly Christological subordination. And, uh, you know, even the Lord Jesus Christ answers to the Father. The only ones who would argue against us is, of course, uh, uh, Unitarians. Ephesians 5.25, and uh, although a husband's priority is God, man's second priority is his wife, not his children, not his work. God first, wife second. Children do not complete a, a husband-wife relationship. They are already complete in that relationship. A husband's-wife relationship needs to work as a team and leadership. And yes, the husband is a senior partner, but a wise leader seeks the counsel of other partners before making any major decision. And it, quite frankly, I think you're an absolute fool if you don't listen to your wife's advice. She's got to live under your decisions. Now, yes, you get to make the ultimate decision. But you better take into consideration that there's somebody else that's in that relationship that might just be a little bit wiser than you. Remember, it's relational subordination. It's not, uh, it is not uh, ontological subordination because you are superior to her. It's relational subordination. So a person communicates the things that are important to him, including the things or people he loves, by the priority he gives them. And priorities in love are both spelled T-I-M-E. If you don't have time for your wife, you don't have time for your children, you do not understand priorities. You say, well, I'm tired. Well, yeah, welcome to the real world. <laughs> we all are. That doesn't mean you should not still take the time. You get a time to, to sleep, that's when you go to bed. Uh, the difficulty is that we've given so much of our time to uh, social media and uh, watching television that we don't have time for the priorities. And as soon as you realize that and repent of it, you'll do a lot better. So when a man allows recreation, vacations, work, or anything else to take pride over or putting the Lord first, he has already failed in his central responsibility in decision-making and leadership. This is equally true of other members of your family. Earning the trust of those under your leadership will be done by the way you communicate priorities, by the delegation of your T-I-M-E, given to those priorities. If your children do not see that priority, don't expect them to follow it. Decision making is making good decisions. So husbands, when your children come and ask permission to do something, think about it. Pray about it. Discuss it privately with your wife if you need to. But what? You make the decision. Never say, well, if it's okay with your mother, it's all right with me. That's just passing the buck. That's not decision making. That's passing the buck. It's your responsibility to make the decision. And your responsibility to take accountability for the decision that you made. Second principle for good leadership is planning. Now you've all seen that sign that goes and says, Plan ahead and then a head comes down around the bottom because it doesn't fit on the sign, you know. But uh, the second principle for good leadership is planning. Planning involves setting long-term and short-term goals. Teach your children how to do that. Leaders do not just let life happen. They don't. Long-term and short-term goals. You want your children to graduate from high school? then the first thing they got to do is graduate from the sixth grade. And you should not be happy that they managed to get B's all the way through the year. Teach them to excel. That's good decision making, good planning. Most of the time children don't get good grades because they do not plan on the time that's necessary to do their homework and to study. 
One reason families do not grow spiritually is that the husband and the father has not set goals for that growth. He's mainly responsible for that. You know, the wife feeds the children and nourishes them physically. The husband is supposed to nourish them spiritually. He needs to plan for that. He does not lay foundations in his family. And if you want to build a house, you need to have a plan. You need to know where to start, where to finish, and everything in the middle. So you've got short-term goals, long-term goals, and ultimately your final goal is to see to your children as heaven is it goes to heaven, is, in, is at the judgment seat of Christ, and he's standing there with gold, silver, and precious stones, not in a pile of ashes. But this requires a long-term plan with incremental accomplishments to achieving, achieving short-term goals. So set, set, set short-term goals. Help your children set term, short-term goals. Ask them what their short-term goal is for growth that year. What is their, what do they want to accomplish this year or this month? Short-term goals. And if you think, if you think that their goal is too high, tell them that their goal is too high, but you're going to pray for them and you're going to help them when you can to achieve that short-term goal. You're the one to which they must be accountable. You're the ultimate accountability partner. And the next one, planning involves budgeting. How many of you got time for everything? No? Anybody? No? Patty? I have time for budgeting. <laughs> she has time for budgeting, yeah. She, she is the most uh, diligent budgeter you will ever meet. But uh, everyone's busy, but good learn, learn, leaders learn to budget everything. They know there's only so much of anything to go around. Uh, they also know that there will be not enough, uh, especially time, for some things. The central arena of a, of a leader's budgeting is time, not money. And time is the greatest gift you can give to your children. How a leader budgets his time is a central measurement of a good decision-making and establishing priorities. How he budgets his time will establish how his family will budget their time. The third principle of good leadership is organize unless you want to agonize. Organize unless you want to agonize. Now, we, you know, the Bible says uh, raise up a child and the way will go and when he's old he not depart from it. Uh, the principle is when he becomes mature he won't depart from it. Now, that's not a universal promise. That is a uh, means to achieve that goal. But children have their own will. And they are rebels by nature. And unless they are taught to love the Lord with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, uh, they're probably not going to grow up to be the kind of leaders, uh, be, kind of, be the kind of people that want, uh, that God will follow. So the old, old adage is a place for everything and everything in its place. And the leader teaches organization by being organized, not by organizing. He teaches organization by being organized, not by organizing. What we usually do is we just try to organize for them, but you teach organization by being organized. And when you're individual life is a mess, don't expect your family's life to be in order. The leader's life and his family's life usually go hand in hand. And it's a difficult thing. Now, I'm going to stop right there. We're going to pick up with that one and come back at it and uh, hit it again next week. But uh, we have a couple more here to look at. But uh, we'll look at them next week. Any questions or comments? Okay, Father, thank you for the time we've had together this morning. We pray that you bless our afternoon or our morning service and afternoon service as well. And uh, thank you for those who are here this morning, faithful, and those who are listening online. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.